Wa alaikum as everyone. Waalaikumsalam, Ramadan Mubarak to you too. Let's wait one more minute, inshallah, and then we'll start. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi <coughs> ajma'in. Uh, hopefully everyone had a wonderful uh, first day um, of, of siyam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the strength uh, to fulfill this entire month in the most pleasing uh, manner. The most pleasing to him, uh, that is. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the strength to do better and put more effort in than what we have done in previous years. Um, before starting, as we mentioned that every night, inshallah ta'ala, we will have this tafsir session for about 30 to 40 minutes maximum, uh, inshallah. So this way you have plenty of time to pray Salatul Isha at home, followed by the Qiyamul Layl that you'll play, pray. Um, first of all, <clears throat> before we get into the topic, uh, I know a lot of you are sad that, of course, the masjid is closed because of this uh, pandemic that's going on, and it's by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is infinite wisdom in every action that He uh, does, everything that He wills. There's infinite wisdom, even though we may not see it at face value but a believer he looks at things from all different angles and he critically analyzes every issue and he can then understand the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom <clears throat> so having said that even though we are not able to go to the masjid at this moment or this month this is very unusual unlike any other Ramadan that perhaps we had in our whole lifetime but this is an opportunity that you you don't have work like you used to. You're not out and about like you used to be in other Ramadan, the previous months of Ramadan that you had in your life. So this should give you an opportunity, a chance to spend more time with the Kalam of Allah, the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the Quran. This is the month of the Quran. Perhaps maybe some of you. You were never able to finish the entire Qur'an in Ramadan. But this year, Allah has given you ample pre free time that you can actually, maybe for the first time in your life, finish reading the entire Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. You, we will not understand the amount of blessings there is in that action. So take advantage of this. Don't be sad that this is closed, that's closed. Take full advantage of the free time, inshallah ta'ala. All right, so every night we're going to have this tafsir session, 30 to 40 minutes. And the surah that we I chose, inshallah ta'ala, if somehow we finish this surah, I think we will. So I'm aiming because some of you uh, contacted me over the past couple of days. It was a request that we don't do two of uh, one of the really lengthy uh, surah, something mediocre length. That, and perhaps maybe we can do uh, two surahs in this month. So inshallah ta'ala, that would be our intention. And the rest is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us success or not. So the surah that I chose for our first uh, session, this might probably take me, uh, let's see, if 17 or 18 nights at, uh, at most. So it's surah Luqman. 
Surah Luqman is Surah number 31 in the Quran. And by all means, since you're sitting at home, if you want to follow along with the Mus'haf, go ahead and do that. You want to take your own notes. Whatever it is, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever way you learn best, please do so. So Surah Luqman, the reason why I chose this, uh, there's a lot of points of benefit in this surah, like in every other surah in the Quran. But in this surah, these 34 ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the concept of ibadah, the concept of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the concept of tawheed, monotheism, the concept of shirk, polytheism. Allah then through the example of this man named Luqman, the surah is named after this man, Luqman. And the Prophet ﷺ said that Luqman al-Hakim, he was a wise man. So the whole surah is named after this person. Luqman was not a prophet. He was a righteous man of the previous generations before Muhammad ﷺ. So Allah used his example to give profound uh, or in-depth explanations about how the Muslim family life is supposed to be. The parent-child relationship. Child-parent relationship. So it addresses ibadah, addresses tawheed, addresses shirk, addresses parents as well as children, and it addresses us Muslim human beings, how we should live about in this worldly life, dealing with uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the six main uh, points of this surah. So again, and as I said, we will go as deep as possible without losing track of the people, right? We don't want to go too much into the information that it becomes too much information for the lay person to uh, absorb. So we want to, inshallah, stick to uh, everybody's level so that everybody understands and this will be something enjoyable for the whole uh, family. Uh, wa alaykum as salam to all the brothers and sisters who are giving their salam. So we said that in this surah, ibadah, worship, tawheed, shirk, um, family values, the parent-child relationship specifically, and also our dealings or our relationship with the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these five, six points are mentioned in this uh, surah. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Luqman, you will see that that is the example every father and mother should do their level best to follow. And the reaction from his son should be what every son and daughter should do their level best to follow as Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the Quran about Ibrahim alayhi salam, Khalilur Rahman. Allah said that وَوَصَابِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ That when uh, this submission to Islam, this is what Allah is talking about. This is a couple of verses from Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam that when he told his children, his sons, وَيَعْقُوبُ and Ya'qub alayhi salam يَا بَنِيَّ إِنَّ اللَّهَ, اصط... إن الله اصطَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينِ That indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for you a true religion. So this was the way of Ibrahim telling his children, his sons, and also Yaqub made sure that he taught this to his sons, his children, that indeed Allah has chosen for you the true religion, which is Islam. فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Therefore do not die except as Muslims. So this was the way, the parenthood of the Anbiya and the Rusul. All the prophets and messengers, they made it very clear at, and upfront with their children while they were alive and on their deathbeds that Islam is the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for you and do not die except as Muslims. And of course, in this month, it is the um, absolute best time for us to set forth our uh, Muslim uh, of doing. All right. So some etiquettes before studying the Qur'an anytime. Anytime you sit down to read the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned to us in the Qur'an that وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ 
Whenever an evil whisper from shaitan comes to you, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ You have to make istiada with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Istiada is the phrase, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That is istiada. The means or the process of seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we are saying, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That I seek refuge in Allah from Shaytan the outcast. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, anytime the whispers of shaitan comes, we are supposed to make isti'adha in him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innahu huwa sami'ul alim. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-hearing and all-knowing. In another verse in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ So very clear. Whenever you are about to, or whenever you are reciting the Qur'an, you're about to begin the recital of the Qur'an, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ You are supposed to make istiada with Allah against the shaitan. So this is a command from Allah that this is the adab, the respect. Whenever we sit down to read the Qur'an, to study the Qur'an, we sit down and that is the first thing that we are supposed to say. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم And if we are going to start from the beginning of any surah, we then say بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful. If you are starting from the middle of a surah, towards the end, or whatever may be the case, any other place other than the beginning, you don't have to say the بسم الله, you just make the isti'adah and then you start. Alright, so Surah Luqman is a Makki Surah. The Qur'an was revealed over 23 years uh, of the Prophet ﷺ's lifetime. The very first time he got the revelation from Allah, he was 40 years old. When he died, he was 63. So the entire Qur'an, 114 chapters, they were revealed over 23 years of the Nubuwa of Muhammad ﷺ. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ, in his lifetime, he only lived in those two cities, Mecca, Medina, and of course, the outskirts of Mecca when some of the trials and tribulations, the boycott, and those things took place in his, uh, in, in his biography. But the revelations came in these two cities. Wa alaykum as salam in Ramadan Mubarak to everybody who is giving the salam and greeting us uh, about the greeting of this month. So either the chapters of the Qur'an were revealed in the city of Mecca or they were revealed in Medina. Surah Luqman is a Makki surah. The other surah are known as Madani, that which was revealed in Medina. So this surah was revealed in Mecca. So let's start now. The very first verse number one. So again, Surah Luqman is our uh, topic for this series. Surah Luqman is Surah number 31 in the 21st uh, Ajza. Alif Lam Mim. This is the first verse. Alif Lam Mim. These three letters are brought together and they do not make up a word. Like it's not a word. Alif Lam Mim. It's not a word. It's not a sentence. It's just three individual letters that have been brought together. And there are about uh, 29 chapters in the Quran that start with, and this is called Al Huruf Al Muqatta'a. Al Huruf Al Muqatta'a. This is what it's called. So you will find, for example, Alif Lam Mim. Surah Al Baqarah also begins the same way. Surah Ali Imran. Um, uh, or you have Hamim. You have uh, Alif Lam Ra so on and so forth. So there are 29 chapters in the Qur'an where the first verse are these individual group of letters that are brought together. Al-Huruf al muqatta'a These are some terminologies, basic terminologies that we should as Muslims make an effort to understand, to memorize these terminologies because this have, these are in relation to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So these are individual letters that are brought together. No one 
except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the real or true meaning of these verses. So in Surah Luqman, verse 1 says, Alif Lam Mim. What exactly is the meaning of this verse 1? Nobody, not even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knew for sure. There is absolutely nothing, not one hadith, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that these huruf al muqatta'ah it means kada wa kada. It means such and such. There is nothing like that, that uh, with a full uh, a conviction that the Prophet ﷺ has explained that this is the meaning of such verses. There's also no verse in the Quran in which Allah says that when I say these letters or when I bring these individual letters, this is the meaning of what I mean. So there is nothing like that in the Quran or Hadith. That's the first thing that we have to remember. So this is verse, a verse one that we don't know the full meaning of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal it to us. All right. Did some of the Sahaba give some kind of interpretation? Yes. Did some of the Salaf, the first three generations, a few of the Sahaba, few of the Tabi'un, few of the Tabi'i tabi the first three generations, the people of the Salaf, right? The righteous uh, Muslims of those first three generations. Did some of the Mufassirun, Mufassir is someone who is a scholar of Quran. Did some of the Mufassirun in the first three generations somewhat give an interpretation? Yes, they did. And they gave two reasons as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts these 29 suwar with these individual letters. There has to be a wisdom because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hakim, the most wise. He never says anything unless there is wisdom, full of wisdom in it. So some of the Mufassirun in the first three generations and later than them, uh, those who followed them in sincerity and in guidance, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, some of them throughout time, they have given a couple of reasons. They didn't say that this is the meaning. No one knows the meaning. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not know the meaning. Therefore, not one human being can claim, by the way, this ayah, alif lam mim, alif lam ra, these ayat mean such and such. There's a very widespread um, false understanding in the Indian subcontinent that when they read alif lam mim, yasin, hamim, taha, these are the names of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah has 99 names. These are nine, part of the 99 names of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is completely false, absolutely baseless. There is no evidence to support this claim whatsoever. So that is a false understanding. These letters are not the names of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These letters are part of the Arabic language. And if you look at the um, the huruf al muqatta'ah throughout the Quran in these 29 uh, chapters, you will see that they consist of exactly half of the letters of the Arabic alphabet. Allah didn't use all of the alphabets of the Arabic language for these first verses of these different surah, only half of the letters. So, what are those two reasons? So, we're again still in verse one. The first reason some of the scholars of the first three generations. And again, it's not the meaning. They said the reason as to why Allah revealed such verses. It's not the meaning. So there's a difference. As th This is perhaps Allah said this or revealed these verses because of these reasons. That's the way the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah speak about such verses. The first reason is that it is a challenge to all the Arab. Everybody whose mother tongue is Arabi, this is a challenge. What is that challenge? When Muhammad wasallam came and he got the message from Jibreel salam that you have been chosen to be the final prophet and messenger from Allah. The Arab, the, the race, the people at that time, the Arab, they were world famous for sha'ir, for poetry. They were rich rich in their language and rich in poetry. This was what it was. Like, for example, let's say when Musa alayhi salam 
was sent to Ali Fir'aun, the people of Fir'aun. What was the people of Fir'aun known for? What? Magic. So here came Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a, a miracle, the staff. Oh, your magicians trick people's eyes that the ropes can turn into snakes. This is a staff that Allah has given. And Allah truly changed the staff into a snake. Allah can transform things really. Magicians, they put a trick on our eyes. We seem to see that which is not real. That's the magic and the kufr and the sihr that people use. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is al-khaliq, the creator, he has the power to change something in the real sense. So Musa alayhi salam was given that. Now, uh, fast forward to the time of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus. What was Bani Israel known for at that time? Medical advancement. Bani Israel, during that time, they were very well known for medical treatment and this and that. So here comes Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, the one who has been given mir miraculous birth, birth without a father, no male interaction, born of a virgin woman, Maryam. Isa alayhi salam had the ability, bi'idhnillah, to cure the leper. He could make a bird out of clay, blow, and the bird will come to life, bi'idhnillah, by the permission of Allah. He could cure the blind, bi'idhnillah. These were medical treatments that was completely unheard of by Bani Israel. A miraculous power that Allah gave to a Rasul that the people were known for. But it was much higher, more advanced. This was the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way of Allah. Every messenger that he sends to a group of people, he sends a specific miracle that those people are well aware of, but they fail. The messenger is given a much more advanced version of that uh, in thing, right? Like, like for example, if suppose, of course, it's not going to happen because we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the final prophet and messenger. Let's suppose, and Allah knows best, this is the era of media. This is the era of technology. Perhaps if Allah had sent a prophet or messenger now, he would have sent a prophet or messenger with such uh, like super intelligent technology that man cannot figure out how is this thing created so that people can believe that this man is not just a normal human being. He has truly been sent by God. This what he's saying is not crazy. So this was the norm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah sent, so let's go back to Surah Luqman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to who? The Arab. Of course, the message of Islam for, is for the whole human race, for alameen, for everything that exists. However, he was specifically sent to the generation or to the race of Arab. They were known, world famous for poetry and their richness in the language. And the language of Arabi is unlike any other language in the world. It is super, super deep and rich in meaning. So the first reason, as the Mufassirun said, this is a challenge to the Arab. They accused Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he is a sha'ir, he is a poet, he's a sahir, he's a magician, and he is a majnoon, he's, mad, he's crazy. These were the three accusations the Arab pagans made against Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here is Allah, individual letters, Alif, Lam, Mim. It's not even in order, Alif, Ba, Ta, no. Alif, then a Lam, and then a Mim. Allah brings it together, and this is the first verse of this surah, and another uh, other surah as well. So Allah brings these individual letters, that hey you Arab, you consider yourself to be so rich in language, so unique and uh, really uh, rich in your poetry. Well, guess what? These are the same letters that you speak, and this is the Qur'an. Come up with something similar to this. And they couldn't. And this was a four-step challenge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's mentioned in the Qur'an itself. It, it, the challenge from Allah came in four different levels because they accused Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ah, he's just reciting poetry, ah, he's crazy, ah, he's just making stuff up, right? So Allah gave this challenge in four different levels. Level one, Allah said, فَلْيَأْتُوا بِحَدِيثِ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ This is in Surah At-Tur. 
this was the first level of the challenge. Let them produce an entire statement like this, a whole book similar to the Quran, in Kanu Sadiqeen, if they are truthful. If they are truly correct in calling my messenger crazy or just a poet, let them bring a book similar to the Quran. Of course, the people failed this challenge. They couldn't produce a whole book like the Quran. So Allah now went to level two. This first stage, nobody could succeed. He made the challenge a little bit easier. Then Allah revealed after some time another verse in the Quran, and this is in Surah Hud. Am they claim that Muhammad has faked this Quran. He forged it. He just made stuff up. All right. قُلْ So say to these people who are making these accusations, فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرَيَاتِ Bring forth just 10 chapters similar to this fake, fake book that you claim. That you claim this book is fake? Fine. Bring just 10 chapters. The first challenge was bring a whole book. Nobody could do it. So the next challenge, less, little less, little easier, right? Just bring 10 chapters similar to this so-called fake book that you say. Invent it. You guys also fake up 10 chapters and bring something forth similar. The first verse, Allah left the challenge to the Arab pagans. By yourselves, come up with a whole book. The second level, you couldn't do it? Fine, just bring 10 chapters and use anyone's help that you want. Go call on anybody to help you. Go call on the other races to come and help you in producing just 10 chapters similar to the Qur'an. Again, of course, nobody was able to succeed. This book is from Allah. No human being can equal it, right? So now comes challenge number three, level three. A little bit easier from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبَدِنَا If you are in doubt regarding that which we have sent to our slave, this book that we have revealed to our slave, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If you are in doubt about its authenticity, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Then bring just one chapter. Whole book, level one. Level two is ten chapters. Level three is just one chapter. Bring just one chapter similar to this book. وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And call on to witness on behalf of you, anyone that you wish. If you are truthful, you guys are liars. You are accusing, falsely accusing my messenger that he faked this book. It's just poetry that he jumbled up together. So if you truly are truthful, bring just one chapter. All right, now the fourth and final level of this challenge. And then Allah called it quits. Everybody realized this is not doable. In Surah Isra, the fourth verse came. Qul, say to the people, if the mankind and jinns were together, they came together to produce something similar to the Quran, they would never be able to produce a book similar to this, even if they had helped one another. So this is the open challenge that exists till today and will exist till the day of resurrection. Every human being on the face of this earth, you disbelieve in the Quran, you think the Quran is fake, no problem. You and everyone from the jinn race help each other, try to produce something similar to this Quran, even one verse equal to this Quran, bring it. You will never be able to do it. And this is why you see, subhanAllah, this is the miracle that Allah gave to the Prophet The greatest miracle of the Prophet was or is the Qur'an itself. Every miracle of every messenger died with them. Does the staff of Musa salam, exist? No, it doesn't. Can anyone cure the leper, cure the blind, uh, give life to a bird? Isa is gone. He's not dead. That's our aqidah. We believe he's alive. He's in heaven waiting for his second coming. But the point is he's not in this dunya anymore. Can anybody do this? No. 
that miracle is gone with him. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa even though he died for the past 1400 years, right? This challenge is ongoing. The miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is ever living because this is the speech of Allah, the kalam of Allah. You can't destroy the Quran, right? This is Allah, his speech. How can you destroy somebody's speech? Once you say something, it's, <laughs> even we know this as a human being, right? Be careful what you say. Once it comes out of your mouth, you can't take it back. So what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbul Alameen? He has spoken this Qur'an. How can anyone ever destroy it? And this is the challenge. Bring forth something similar, even just one verse similar to this book. No one can ever do it. Because this are th these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first reason that the Mufassirun gave. That this is a challenge to the Arab race and anybody else. That you guys speak the same language. You're disbelieving in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa claiming that he's a poet. Fine, use these same letters, produce something similar, even if it's just one verse. The second reason that um, the scholars, the Mufassirun of old, they mentioned is it shows to us that the Quran can never ever be in any other language except for Arabi. What does this mean? Verse number one in Surah Luqman is Alif Lam Mim. Is there a translation for this verse in any other language in this world? Think about it. If you're speaking Chinese or Hindi or Urdu or Bengali or English or French, Italian, Spanish, whatever, every language that exists and they're all from Allah, can any language on the face of this earth translate these verses in the Quran? No, they can't. The Qur'an is an Arabic Qur'an. That is the Qur'an. This is the uniqueness of this language. Literally, these verses have zero translation in any other language. This is the miracle of the Arabic language. This is the miracle of the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse, in Surah Zumar, He said, Qur'anan Arabiyan ghayra di iwaj. This Qur'an is an Arabic Qur'an, غَيْرَ the iwaj, without any crookedness. It's a very clear-cut, straight message, very blunt. Allah doesn't feel shy to tell people, this leads to Jahannam, this leads to paradise, this is Tawheed, this is Shirk, this is Halal, this is Haram. Very clear-cut. There's no crookedness, there's no beating around the bush when it comes to the Qur'an. That's not how Allah talks. So this is an Arabic Qur'an without any crookedness. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ So that perhaps the people who read this book, who believe in this book, they can attain piety. They can become righteous. And of course, one of the goals of Ramadan is the same thing. That Allah prescribed uh, Siyam just like it was prescribed before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain taqwa. You want to believe? You want to attain increase in taqwa? Also connect with the Qur'an, which is, this is this month four. So this is verse one, right? So this is the meaning of Alif Lam uh, Mim, uh, or, you know, what, the reasons behind it. But as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar, Uthman, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, these are from the giants, from the scholars of the Sahaba. They all said the absolute true meaning of these verses, Allahu A'lam. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. So again, brothers and sisters, if some long, big bearded guy today says, I had a dream, Alif Lam Mim, it means such and such. Don't believe him. He's a liar. Clear cut. Abu Bakr did not know the meaning of this. <laughs> right? Umar didn't know the meaning of this. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did not know the meaning of it. Somebody today will definitely never ever know the meaning. So these are a couple of the reasons that the Mufassirun, they said as to why perhaps this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started some of these chapters with these huruf al individual letters. Uh, and he started the surah this way. All right, so inshallah ta'ala, uh, I think for tonight our time is up. How long has it been? 30 some minutes? All right, so as I said, 
inshallah ta'ala we will go with every verse as deep as possible in depth so we only covered one verse right so that's why i chose this surah with 34 verses so that at least inshallah over the month we can finish it so i'll spend maybe six or seven minutes if there is any question this way we can finish in 40 to 45 minutes that's our goal we don't want to stay here for too long because you you want to pray Aisha, you want to pray Qiyamul Layl uh, for the night as well. So let me see if there's any questions. Um, first, in on topic questions. So far, all I see are greetings and Ramadan Mubarak greetings and salams. Are there any questions? Oh, okay. Will Arabic ever be an international language instead of English when... Uh, Isa alayhi salam comes back. Um, Allah knows best, we do not know. However, we can tell you something about the past. The Muslim Ummah, it's all when we had, when, you know, the golden era of the Muslim Ummah, uh, and even before, up until probably when the Europeans started conquering our lands and dividing us, Arabic was either a first language in the Arabic speaking countries, or it was like a second language, right? This was the your connection as a Muslim with Islam, whether you like it or not, you are related to the Arabic language, right? I know a lot of our people, people from my part of the world, they're really staunch in their Urdu and their Bengali. It's like this is the holy language. All languages are from Allah. There's no problem. This is one of the beauties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave these hundreds and thousands of different languages in this dunya. It shows us the power of Allah. However, your religion is connected to the Arabic language. You have to accept this and you have to make an effort to understand this language, to learn this language, at least to the point where you can understand the Quran. What you're reading, you should be able to understand. So in the past, people, they valued the Arabic language. And one of the first things these conquerors did in our countries, they disconnected us from the language. You look at places like Turkey. Turkish language didn't have Latin letters. When people conquered them, let's change it. Let's change the Arabic letters in their language so they get completely disconnected. Right? You look at so many Muslim languages, they used to have letters where they could at least read the Arabic language. But you look at the Soviet Muslim countries of old, all of them were forced to adapt to the Russian language and this and that. These kuffar, they knew exactly what they were doing when they came into our lands and oppressed and conquered us. Uh, can we brush our teeth with paste in the daytime in Ramadan? Yes, of course, inshallah, no problem. Just make sure you don't swallow uh, the toothpaste. Right. Is it permissible to yell at the top of your lungs? Uh, the Prophet sallallahu I, I can't really say something that there is. This is halal or haram, but we can give an example from the Prophet sallallahu He was never known to have raised his voice except for a couple of situations or three situations in in the khutbah, because that's from the Sunnah of Juma khutbah. The Prophet ﷺ, when he delivered the khutbah, his face would be red. As Jabir ibn Abdullah said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, we were scared every time he gave the khutbah. We, we thought that there's an army about to attack us. That is the sunnah of the khutbah delivery. That's how you're supposed to deliver the Jummah khutbah. Other point, maybe if he's calling somebody from far away and in the battlefield, if he has to say something to the enemy from far away or something like that. Other than this, the Prophet ﷺ never ever raised his voice. But we, of course, we are, uh, you know, people who, with a lot of shortcomings, with a lot of mistakes, uh, different reasons, medical reasons, physical reasons, emotional reasons, many people start shouting and howling. This isn't the best of the things. Of course, this is Ramadan. Repent for these mistakes of yours and work on uh, yourself. Uh, can I open the Qur'an and recite while praying Taraweeh? This is completely allowed. Don't worry about it. Well, throughout the year when you're praying your Qiyamul Layl, Tahajjud prayers, you are allowed to open the Mus'haf. Well, nowadays we have smartphones. So you have the whole Qur'an app. 
So you can hold the, uh, the phone uh, in front of you and pray, not an issue, because this is a sunnah prayer. So you're allowed to uh, do this. How should one take the medication in Ramadan? You should not take medication in Ramadan unless it's something, uh, uh, something like a a asthma inhaler or something like that. But actual pills and things like that, this is not something that you're supposed to take while uh, fasting. All right, another brother just sent a message. Can my son be our imam sometimes in the salah uh, when we're praying? Of course, this is completely allowed. Don't worry about it. Uh, and you should, uh, if you have your children, well, uh, let me specify, because your daughter can't lead the whole family in uh, salah. Your daughter can lead your wife and her other sisters in salah, but your son can lead the entire family in the salah if need be. If you want him to be trained and make him practice, not a problem at all. Uh, okay, so I, I think since it's the first night, I'll just spend a couple of more minutes uh, with the questions because I see uh, brothers and sisters sending me some specifically Ramadan related questions. So I don't want to uh, let me address them, inshallah, before you end for tonight. Um, one another brother, there are a few Ramadan schedules circulating. They have different times for the iftar to each other. Uh, this is something that I addressed la yesterday in the 10 minute video, but if anybody wasn't, um, didn't get receive that message yet, briefly, again, we are supposed to rush to our iftar. This is from the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's not just a command. La tazalu ummati bi khayrin. My ummah will not cease to be upon goodness. They will not stop receiving the khayr from Allah. As long as ma ajalu iftar as long as they rush for the iftar and they delay the suhoor as much as possible. So iftar means the moment the disk of the sun has set, even though there is still redness in the sky, that's not the point. It's already maghrib time and that is your iftar time. As soon as the disk disappears, you rush for your iftar. And as I mentioned yesterday, we are alhamdulillah blessed to be living right next to the Bahar, next to Atlantic Ocean. Go out of your house, st stick your neck out, look out the window, walk a couple of blocks, look at the time when the sun's disc disappears. That is the genuine time of iftar. And so inshallah ta'ala, the schedule that you have from our masjid, it is as close as can be to that uh, time bi'ithnillah. But if you want to be truly, truly perfect, by all means, take a walk down tomorrow at sunset, right? It'll be some type of romantic iftar. You and your wife go take, we'll take a walk at the beach, look at the sunset together, break your iftar, pray maghrib, and then come home and finish your dinner, right? <laughs> Try that, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so my point is, the other schedules, whatever they are, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward whoever made it. We're not shunning that down, but I'm giving the reason as to why our schedule says such and such. So follow the sunnah of rushing to the iftar. Uh, can we pray group tarawih at home and everyone can stand six feet apart? No, you're inside your house. <laughs> you're inside your house. You can't be standing apart from your wife and children or anything like that. So pray the uh, uh, group tarawih uh, if you want in your house. That is all fine. Okay, follow up question. Even if the son hasn't reached puberty, is this okay uh, to do if I let him? Uh, lead the prayer. This is not a problem at all. There are authentic ahadith. A four or five year old, the Prophet ﷺ assigned him to lead the people in Salah, his whole tribe. You know why? Because he had memorized Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave him that respect. He was like a five year old kid. We would call him a kid. But he was appointed by Rasulullah that you lead your entire tribe when it's time for salah. So don't worry about it, um, inshallah ta'ala. As long as he understands what are the steps of salah, he knows he's not, it's not like a five-year-old reciting, Alhamdulillah, hey, 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 he starts just giggling, you don't want to, that means this kid is not mature. So the point is, regardless of age, as long as he is mentally mature, he can lead your family in salah, inshallah ta'ala, no problem. Do we have to pay zakat for the things I wear every day, uh, especially for the women who wear gold every day? Um, 
well, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, no brother wears gold because uh, this is the hadith. Everybody knows this. Wearing gold for men is haram. This is jewelry for women only. Um, there's, there are, there's the hadith in Sahih Muslim in which the Prophet ﷺ clearly said to Aisha after grabbing her bangles that she had, did you pay the dues? Did you pay the zakat? And she said no. And he said that these two will be the fire for you. Meaning give your zakat. Those were bangles that she used to wear on a regular basis. So that hadith is proof that you should give zakat as long as it reaches 85 grams of gold, pure gold, 85 grams. That's the nisab. If it has, if it has reached that amount, then you give zakat on your uh, um, jewelry as well that you wear. All right, so... What is the tawbah? Tawbah is the repentance. Tawbah is to repent to Allah. And this is the month of repentance. Tawbah is different from istighfar. Because there istighfar, like someone made istighfar, like Allahumma ghfirli. Oh Allah, forgive me. This does not mean tawbah. Tawbah, tubu ilallah, return to Allah. You completely give up that sin. You return to Allah and you don't go back to the sin. Someone who's seeking forgiveness, like us, we may say, oh Allah, forgive me. Then tomorrow we repeat the sin. The next day we say, oh Allah, forgive me. It's a cycle. That's forgiveness. We're seeking forgiveness. We haven't truly made tawbah. Tawbah is when you return to Allah. You completely give up that sin and you don't return uh, to uh, that sin. So you give it up. It's the process. It's a whole process. You give it up, you ask Allah to forgive you, and you don't go back to the sin. You completely return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, Zakatul Fitr, we, we still have time. Inshallah, today is just the first day that we just finished. So inshallah, I'll get to that. All right, the last question. Do I have to pray Taraweeh and also Tahajjud? Both. Um, these are both the same prayer, as we said. And this will be the last question for tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Salatul Layl, Qiyamul Layl, Salatul Witr, Salatul Taraweeh, Salatul Tahajjud. Five names for the exact same prayer. The word Tahajjud is found in the Quran once in Surah Isra. The words in Hadith is Salatul Layl, Qiyamul Layl, Salatul Witr. These are the names in Hadith. The word taraweeh does not exist even once in the Quran nor in Hadith. There is not a single Hadith that you will find where the word taraweeh is mentioned. It's only Qiyamul Layl, standing at night, Salatul Layl, the night prayer, uh, Salatul Witr, the odd Salah, the total number of raka'at is odd. So these are the words found in Hadith. Tahajjud is found in the Quran. Salatul Taraweeh, it came later on. There, it's the same prayer. The Prophet ﷺ prayed this night prayer. And by night prayer, it means the prayer between Isha and Fajr. Isha is the last prayer of the five times, daily prayer, right? Between Isha and the next day, Fajr, you have the time to pray. Qiyamul Layl, Salatul Layl, Tahajjud, uh, Salatul Witr. This is the time span that you have. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ prayed in the beginning of the night, meaning right after Salatul Asha. Sometimes he prayed in the middle of the night. Sometimes he prayed in the last one-third, the last third, and this is the absolute best time. So you divide the night into three parts. Sometimes you can pray it at the beginning, in the middle, or the end. As is customary from the time of the Sahaba, in Ramadan, the tahajjud prayers were prayed right after Isha so that people, you think about it. If we pray Isha, right now is like at 10, like we're going to be praying Isha now, right? Is somebody going to come to the masjid by the hundreds, men and women, at 3 a.m. all month long? It's difficult. It is a burden on people. They have small children. They have work. They have school, whatever may be the case. So we pray the jama'ah in the early part of the night. Right after Isha, we have Salatu Taraweeh in the masjid. It doesn't mean it's a different prayer. The Prophet ﷺ would pray sometimes in the beginning, in the middle, or in the last third of the night. So this is 
the exact same prayer as our mother Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned. She was asked, and this is hadith collected in Bukhari and Muslim. She was asked, how was the prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam fi Ramadan, in Ramadan? And Aisha replied, whether it was in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan, it didn't matter. Meaning all year round, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam prayed maximum 11 raka'at. Alright, so this is the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. So you have to understand this, that this is the sunnah of Rasulullah. There is no one on the face of this earth that can find one hadith that says the Prophet himself prayed more than 11 any night all throughout the year. That hadith does not exist. It doesn't. Even the scholars who say you can pray 20, they make it very clear the Prophet never prayed 20. They make it very clear because it does not exist. The Prophet himself never prayed more than 11 throughout the year. So we want to stick to the Sunnah as much as possible, inshallah ta'ala. There were some madahib. Don't just think that the Hanafi madhab, they pray 20. There were some madahib before, they prayed 36. There were some madahib, they prayed 48. Those madahib died out. So if I can, I can tell the Hanafi brothers, why do you think 20 is the, that's it, that's the gold standard. What about the people that used to pray 36 and 48? But these are madhabi opinions. But if you ask me, what did the Prophet ﷺ pray himself? Maximum 11. And there is not a single alim in this dunya, past and present, who can say otherwise. Everybody knows this. The Prophet himself never prayed more than 11. And it is the exact same uh, prayer. Right? So inshallah ta'ala, hopefully this is uh, clear. It's not the opinion of your Imam Tawfiq. It's, the, it's a hadith from Bukhari and Muslim and the opinion of many, many scholars since the uh, beginning, right? Until now, inshallah ta'ala. All right, so we will meet again tomorrow night. We will uh, start with uh, verse 2. But we're not going to go off topic questions. We want to finish with by between 9 to 9.45, inshallah ta'ala. So hopefully this is good. Um, you are okay with me going this deep with the verses. Of course, some verses are not going to be this lengthy. We might be able to do two or three verses in one night. Uh, but this will, inshallah ta'ala, be fine. And as I said, take notes. This is the Qur'an. You want to understand it to the best of your ability so that you can benefit. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from Ahlul Qur'an, from the people of the Qur'an. And of course, Ahlul Hadith too, right? You can't be from Ahlul Hadith if you're not from Ahlul Qur'an because they're connected. So make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from Ahlul Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our siyam, our qiyam, and all the good deeds that we will do throughout this month. And before concluding, remember that $100 challenge. Inshallah ta'ala, the brothers from the management, uh, they uh, messaged me again today. These are for the masjid expenses, inshallah ta'ala. And the goal is that every capable man and woman Age doesn't matter. Every capable man and woman in this entire month, throughout this whole month, a total of at least $100 uh, that you can save up. They will let me know when will be the drop-off day. So they're working on a plan where we'll, I'll be there, they'll be there in the masjid for a few hours. You guys just <laughs> drive by sadaqah, right? Just drive by, throw the envelope at the masjid door and they'll collect it. This will be much easier for everybody to participate. And of course, those who have access to the website, mcosj.com, you know how to donate online. Go ahead and donate that $100, inshallah ta'ala. And if you want to wait until maybe probably next week so you can come and drop off, inshallah, that's fine. But the goal is at least $100 from every capable male and female of our community, inshallah ta'ala. All right, so I'll see you guys Again, inshallah, tomorrow night. Subhanakallahu bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaikum.